The Fourth Letter I shall at once further clear up your suspicion whether I, perhaps, intend to set forth Freemasonry as an end in itself, if I put before you the second conclusion from what we have considered above with respect to the greater human society as the keystone of this arch of thought. We have now recognized it as an evil that education in the greater society is always bound up with a certain one-sidedness and superficiality which stands in the way of the highest possible, i.e. purely human, development and hinders the individual man as well as mankind as a whole from a happy progress to the goal. We now have a purpose given us which the greater of human society cannot aim, since it lies outside of that society, and is first manifest through the existence of society, a purpose which can only be reached by going out from society and setting apart from it. The purpose is to do away with the disadvantages in the mode of education in the greater society, and to merge the one-sided education for the special vocation in the all-sided training of men as men. This is a great purpose, since it has for its object what is of most interest to man. It is reasonable in that it expresses one of our highest duties. It is possible, since everything is possible, that we ought to do. It is almost impossible to attain in the great society, at least exceedingly hard, since walk of life, mode of living, and relations entangle man with fine but fast ties and pull him around in a circle, often without his being aware of it where he should go forward, hence the purpose is only to be attained by getting apart, but not by an ever-during departure, since a one-sidedness would arise from that, since thereby the advantages for society of what has been won for pure human development would be lost, and since thereby we disregard that we are to merge both forms of training, and thereby to elevate needful training for vocations, nor are we to attain the purpose by turning back to isolation, since this would strengthen our one-sidedness more than it would remove it and overlay our heart with an egotistic crust. Therefore, we shall attain the purpose only through a society distinct from the greater society, which does no injury to any of our relations in the greater society, which has prepared us to see and take heart in time the purpose of humanity, to make intentionally ours, which works through a thousand means to wean us from our vocational and social crudities, and raise our development to a purely human one. This or none is the purpose of the Society of Freemasons. So certainly the wise and virtuous man may occupy himself with it. The Mason who was born a man and had been shaped through the training for his vocation through the state and through his other social relations may be developed again on this platform wholly and thoroughly to a man. This only can be the purpose of a separate society and it answers the question put to us. What is the order of Freemasons in and of itself? Or if you prefer, what can it be? But you say the purpose is part too wide and part too narrow, the latter because the end can be reached in other ways, by meditation, by travel, by going about among men, and in sociable life, the former because no society of any sort, from its very nature, can realize the full attainment of that purpose, as to the former, about which the necessary light will come in what is to follow, for the moment I will make only this short answer. A man can drag himself out in the ways you have described and maintain a course which goes out beyond his walk of life. He can learn to efface the pedantry from his outside appearance and to raise his thought to a greater generality. But his inner self remains untouched by all of this. He goes on his old way. Only he does so behind hedges and elegant walls. Perhaps by meditation he can efface the professional spirit in himself but may give himself more stiff-neckedness to his individual character, which is still very different from the character of pure humanity. That which in this connection ought to be brought about in all seriousness can only happen in a separate society, as we have deduced it, and as you will come soon to think with me, in accord with its whole activity. The second proposition which you have pointed out is more important, and I may add my statement of the purpose of following important limitation. Insofar as such development is possible through a society expressly set up for this purpose, there is a general kind of development for which everyone takes himself, his conscience, and God for witness and judge, namely moral freedom. You know my conviction on this point. Everyone who is honest with himself, so I wrote some years ago, must watch himself unremittingly and work toward his perfection. This must, through practice, become, as it were, natural to him. But this is something which, from its very nature, cannot be communicated. I come to a painter whom I wish to see work. He shows me all his paintings, even those yet not finished. But as much as I have begged him to, he is unwilling to work upon them before my eyes. He assures me that the works of genius are arrived at only in solitude. This led me to the work of the moral genius in us, and I suspected that the truth in this matter, too, 
one must be alone. I found it always more confirmed, and the true striving to perfect oneself was very delicate and bashful, so that it drew within itself and could not be communicated. I had never brought my betterings of myself before myself in words. How could I clothe it in words before others? Enough. I took another course, and my friends, as I myself, knew the growth of the plant only by the fruits. Accordingly, one should never make his self-bettering a show. He should never abase himself to a mere confession of his faults, and should leave them off. We should be disgusted with them. Then we shall not, as it were, turn them about this way, and that in order to express them precisely and elegantly. If one wished, out of a mistaken feeling of duty, out of a certain heroic spirit, in friendship or for the sake of purpose of some society, to compel himself thereto, he would not make himself trusted, win love for himself, at any rate, no more fear the existence of faults which one is so roundly condemned. At any rate, corrupt himself with the confession in that he would reckon it to himself as a bettering. And so it is. His development for moral freedom in order to make it a social affair, to speak about it with others, to let himself be drawn into a reckoning about it, and to confess it or let himself confess, destroys the spirit from the ground up, since it violates holy modesty. It makes one a slanderous hypocrite before himself, in a society which has to do with this, leads in effect to the darkest monkish aestheticism. Thus masonry has nothing to do with this sort of training for pure humanity, nor any society which is not made up of fanatics, and as understood Horace's saying, Insani sapiens nomen ferret, aquius in qui ultra quam satis est virtuum si patat ipsum. All that looks to differences among men, whether in skill or art or virtue, is before masonry profane, but masonry itself is profane in comparison with moral freedom, since that is the all-holiest compared to which even the holy is common. This conception, firm and thoroughly defined and clear in itself, we must undoubtedly make a canon of masonry, and a principle of critique of everything masonic, if we have to set up such a critique. Another is, to be sure, to put it shortly, the training of the spirit and the impetus to receptivity for morality, the training of external morals and of external uniformity to law. This, of course, belongs to masonry. Now the picture of masonry, as it is, in and of itself, or uniquely can and should be, will govern your soul. I draw this picture as yet with few strokes. Here men of all walks of life come freely together, bring into a hoard what each, according to his own individual character, has been able to acquire in his calling. Each brings and gives what he has, the thinking man definite and clear conceptions, the man of business readiness and ease in the art of living, the religious man his religious sense, the artist in his religious enthusiasm. But none imparts it in the same way in which he received it in his calling, and would propagate it in his calling. Each one, as it were, leaves behind the individual, and in special, and shows what it has worked out within him as a result. He strives to give his contribution, that he can reach every member of society, and the whole society exerts itself to assist this endeavor, and in this way, to give his former one-sided training a general usefulness and all-sidedness. In this union, each receives in the same measure as he gives. Just through this that he gives it, it is given him. This is to say, the skill to give.